Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I was going to talk about one thing today, but another thing came up. We are during sutra class or dharma class is a better. I need to change my vocabulary there because sometimes we we look at a book somebody's written about Buddhism or Zen, and so it, it isn't technically a sutra class. Um, but it is a Dharma class. And we're looking at the Sutra of Vilamakirti Niradesh. Uh, and Vilamakirti was a lay person. And he's the only lay person that a Sutra is written about. And uh, in the very beginning of it, uh, the sutra declares what the pure land is about and what conditions have to exist for the pure land. And um, it, it uh, goes on for a long time and describes just about every condition you can imagine. And so the question came up during the class, uh, what's going on with the pure land? Do they use this sutra? And I said, no, they don't use this sutra. Because it would kind of go against basic pure land belief. Which brings us to today and this moment. And what is this pure land belief? And so um, Buddhism has been in this country about 130, 140 years now which uh, is not very long, and I don't mean Buddhism has been here as a fully organized and uh, orchestrated religion. I mean that the first Buddhist monk came here uh, for, for a gathering of the Conference of Religions and gave a talk to a translator, and he was the only monk that was there. And there were no other monks in this country at that time. And he stayed for a while. And then had to go back to Japan because he was the abbot of a, of a monastery there. And later on he sent a couple students here to help introduce the practice of Zen to uh, the Americans. Because they seemed to be attracted to it. Pure Land came to this country when the Chinese and later the Japanese came here uh, to work. And the Japanese have been working in what was an American territory and eventually a state for a long time because I always have to remind myself that Hawaii is halfway between here and Japan. It's not off the coast. You know, I used to think and still do sometimes, it's sort of like Catalina. It's one of the, those islands out there bobbing around. Well, it's not. All you have to do is go for vacation there and you discover how much it costs to get there. Uh, no, it's, it's halfway between here and Japan and the Japanese go to Hawaii and they have been going for a very long time to work in the sugar plantations and the pineapple plantations there. And the men would go for uh, a number of years and then go back to Japan with all their savings and perhaps buy a little piece of land or an apartment or something like that. And eventually they ended up coming here. And that would be the, the great gold rush in California. Uh, the Chinese came here for the same reason the Japanese went to Hawaii. The Chinese came here to make a little money and go back to China and uh, maybe buy a nice house for the family or a little land, a little farmland, or something like that. And they came here and uh, for the gold fields and ended up building our railroad system on uh, the, the second half of it, the first half being built uh, from back east to about the midpoint, you know, promontory point, history lesson in high school. And the Chinese built the railroad from San Francisco area all the way to Promontory Point. 
and uh, put in some pretty long days and made a little bit of money and a lot of them went back to China and bought a little house for their family or a little piece of land to farm and a lot of them stayed because they were in California and as you all know you live in the fifth wealthiest country in the world in California. Uh, we seem like we're doing a pretty good job of trying to destroy that but we, as the last time I checked we are still the fifth most successful economy in the world in this state and we have the Central Valley to thank for that. We produce over 80% of the vegetables and produce that are eaten by our country. If, we, if something were to happen to us, which is happening right now with the water shortage, it wouldn't be just us that were suffering or our farmers that were suffering. The entire United States would suffer. Uh, they might just have to live on potatoes like the Irish did because we couldn't, uh, you know, weren't able to grow enough carrots and turnips and cabbage and lettuce. But to me, it's amazing that we grow lettuce for salads in New York City. But we have these very fancy refrigeration trucks that are able to move stuff and people that are willing to spend their life driving those trucks. So we had the Chinese here and we had the Japanese here. Both of them have Pure Land Buddhism. And the Pure Land Buddhism they have is not the same. Should not be confused one with the other. In China, it's going to be a little history lesson today. It's already started that way. In China, when the Buddhist monks came over from India, one of the concepts, and scholars still struggle with this concept, is that um, after Buddhism had been in China for quite a while, and it was there about 300, roughly 300 years as far as we can tell, before, before they had the first Sanghas, they had their Chinese monks, Chinese nuns. And in the beginning, there were no fully ordained monks or nuns because there were not enough fully ordained monks coming from India to ordain the monks and nuns. Uh, so it was a, a procedural problem, but it was real. In order to create a fully ordained monk, there's two fully ordained monks right there. I have to assemble nine other fully ordained monks to ordain them. And when we're talking about someplace like China, uh, which it was perilous for the Indian monks to get there, they either had to cross the Gobi Desert, about half of them died, or they had to go by the sea route. Uh, and these wonderful ships that the Chinese built that didn't float very well and about half of them died. So, you know, it was, it was quite an adventure to, to go to China. And to make it even more complicated, in order to have nuns, uh, in America we don't really follow this rule anymore, although somebody could get upset with us. But I think that rule has been relaxed. You had to have 10 fully ordained monks and 10 fully ordained nuns. That means you had to have 20 fully ordained. That's a lot. And you want them all to travel from India to China, and when they get there and they're still alive, then they have to organize these ordination platforms. They eventually happen, but it took quite a while. The vision we have is that after a few hundred years in China, there were a number of schools of Buddhism that developed. Uh, some around sutras and some around practice. The Zen school, of course, is the meditation school, and it developed around the practice of meditation, meaning that the primary practice, not the only practice, but the primary practice of the monks and nuns was meditation. Um, the Tendai school, which was very powerful and 
popular in China, eventually went to Japan, and it became the, the uh, well, it was a Tendai school in Japan, it was a Tiendai in China, almost exactly the same pronunciation. And they followed the Lotus Sutra, and they did some meditation, and they did some ceremonies. And I've always thought of them as being a very balanced particular school in that they, they everybody uh, meditated, everybody did ceremonies, and everybody studied the Lotus Sutra, which is probably the single most important sutra in the Mahayana canon. And then there was the Pure Land. And we have to say to ourselves, when did the Pure Land get into China? Or when did it develop in China? Because obviously it didn't go there from India, because India was Theravada Buddhism, as we know it today. And it was a very pure form of Buddhism. And if you don't believe me, just ask one of them and they'll tell you that they're, they're it. They are the pure form of Buddhism and everybody should be doing what they do. Except that we have some historical records. Because if there's one thing the Chinese do is they keep records. They keep records like nobody's business. Apparently, our president today, and our president before him, and the vice president before this one, all had a problem with records. If you've been following the newspaper, I read it and I go, it's not a party thing, it's not Republicans, it's not Democrats, everybody takes top secret papers home and reads them as they're watching television or having dinner. And then they shuffle them off to the garage, the store, for, oh, maybe the next time they have a chance to take them back to where they belong. Well, the Chinese were just absolutely wonderful about keeping records of what was going on. So we have a pretty good idea that the first monk entered China in the first century, around 53 Christian era. That's pretty early. And the first thing these monks did as they slowly trickled into China was they set up translation bureaus because they spoke Chinese, or I mean, sorry, they, they spoke a variety of Indian dialects and the Chinese spoke a variety of Chinese dialects because China and India are two huge countries. And they did a wonderful job of translating. We know this because scholars have gone back, looked at the, what they translated, look at what the current translation are, and they're almost, not quite, almost identical. And it was a phenomenon. One of the things we know that happened during the first couple centuries of the presence of Buddhism in China was they imported statues, just like we do in this country. There, there are some companies in this country that are now making Buddha statues, and you get to look at one when you drive down our little Dharma road. That has a name, by the way. He got, got it on uh, maps. Yeah, when you go to do GPS maps, it'll say Dharma road. You can blame that monk right there. He decided that should happen. And so, Someday we actually have to put a sign out there that says Dharma Road. Um, but you get to see our beautiful Nirvana Buddha, which is the Buddha laying down. And this is uh, when he's getting ready to pass away. And uh, the, the monks are gathering around him. We don't have lots of monks to put around him there, so we just gather around once in a while. And that was made here. There are people making Buddha statues here now. These wonderful Buddha statues we have in the back came from Vietnam, donated by a lady who was in San Jose at the time. So the same sort of thing happened in China. There were no statues of the Buddha. Now, these, two, these three statues you see here, uh, you may have asked uh, Venerable Tom Mung, who are they? 
And he would say, well, the statue in the center, that would be Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha that we know as Siddhartha Gautama. Well, who are those other guys? Well, one of those guys is Ananda. Ananda was his cousin. He was his attendant his whole life. Ananda had what we call a didactic memory, or you know, may know it as a photographic memory. He could remember everything the Buddha said. And we owe the sutras to Ananda that he recited them. And eventually they got written down. And on the other side is Shariputra. Shariputra was one of the ten chief disciples of the Buddha. And the Buddha said that Shariputra was an arahat, which means he was a Buddha also. And the Buddha actually had 50 disciples that he recognized as being enlightened. <clears throat> so that's who they are. They're all historical figures. They're not made up Buddhas. <clears throat> we have made up Buddhas. Just so you know why I said that, we do have made up Buddhas. We have ideal Buddhas, Buddhas that represent the way we should act, and the way we should be good. Kwanzeum, or Konan in Japan, or Kuan Yin in China, is on one stand is not a historical Buddha. First of all, it's a Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is one who has accomplished a great deal in their, deal in their spiritual development, but they're not quite a Buddha yet. But boy, they're pretty good. And uh, <clears throat> when I say she's not quite historical, but then again, there are 12 forms of Kuan Yin recognized by Chinese Buddhists. And every one of them, those 12, was a historical figure. One of the most famous, famous stories about Kuan Yin is as a princess during an era in China. Uh, we don't know exactly how this happened, but her parents were uh, almost eaten by a tiger. And the tiger was hungry, and the tiger had babies, and, and uh, the tiger was going to eat these two so that they, she could feed her babies. And their daughter, who later on becomes a princess, their daughter stepped forward and sacrificed herself to the tiger to save her parents. And the Chinese recognize that. And they have a name. I don't know all the names. But they, they all have a slightly different name of version of Kuan Yin. Kuan Yin is uh, the great mother. I always think of the Catholic uh, Virgin Mary as the great mother of Catholicism, and Kuan Yin is the great mother in Buddhism. Kuan Yin is willing to sacrifice any and everything to help you stop suffering. And that's the way she's looked at by the Chinese. Now understand that the Chinese and the Vietnamese for about 848 years the Vietnamese were part of China. In other words, about four times the length of time that this has been a country, they were part of China. They were a protectorate. Of course, the Chinese looked at them as barbarians, but they were still controlled by China. And eventually, they were able to break away from China and be their own country. Well, going in, going into China from India were statues. Get back to the statues. And they imported Buddha statues. Even though the Buddha said before he died, don't make any statues. He said, no, don't make any statues because the next thing you go, you're going to turn me into God. And I am not God. I am simply a man. 
And everybody said, okay, all right, we won't, we won't turn you into a god, we won't make statues out of you. And that, it was good for a couple hundred years until one day somebody said, you know, he's not around anymore. We could, we could make some statues and probably the sky would not fall on us. Mm -hmm. And so they started making statues to remember the Buddha. Typically in the meditation posture because we, we know that the Buddha awakened while doing meditation. That's why meditation is important in Buddhism. And that's the argument Zen has why everybody should meditate. Because if you meditate every day a little bit, you will eventually see your Buddha nature. Uh, you always had it. It never went anywhere, but you kind of lost track of it, and meditation will bring you back to your Buddha nature. Well, for every statue of the Buddha that was imported into China, ten statues of Kuan Yin was imported. Now, if you've read any scholarly works at all, they will tell you that Kuan Yin was a non-historical bodhisattva that was invented in China, which I find pretty interesting because they're importing all these statues of a bodhisattva, one who is almost enlightened, one who hears the cries of the world. Avalokiteshvara, which is her Sanskrit name, by the way, all bodhisattvas are men, because it's a man's world, right? Except, they didn't buy that. By the time she got to China, she was no longer a man. She was a woman, because how do we express compassion? Who has compassion for all who suffer? Women. Men are big, tough guys, right? We, yeah, we'll, we'll, we don't ever cry. We're big, tough guys. But women, they get to cry, and they get to have emotions, and they get to have feelings. And they also get to be mothers, and they get to take care of people, little people and big people. And so all these statues were coming in. So by golly, it must mean that that notion was already somewhere in there between India and China. That notion became strong. The notion of the Pure Land is that there is a place when we pass away, because we're all going to pass away, and we have a strong belief in reincarnation. The Buddha never rejected the notion of reincarnation. It is without a doubt a Hindu idea, but he never rejected it. It's the only thing, karma, and reincarnation, it's the only thing the Buddha did not reject. Now, he didn't ever say that the Hindus were wrong about anything. He didn't say that. He said, do not believe something just because everybody else believes it. So you need to step back from the religious beliefs that are developing in India at the time and be honest with yourself does this make any sense? You know, I hear people say, I don't believe in God because it doesn't make any sense. Well, that's a good reason not to believe in God. And other people say, I believe in God because how could, how could all of this be here without a great creator? That's a good reason to believe in God. People usually, the people that irritate me are the people that don't believe in God and don't know why. And the people that believe in God irritate me who don't know why they believe in God. Because you really need to step back. I think everybody in their life sometimes has a crisis of religion. I did. That they step back and they wonder if they believe what their parents believe. And some people come away from that going, no, I don't believe what I'm, you know. I don't think that I have to let my hair grow and never cut it. Or... You know, the, the Pentecostal model, the, the dresses, uh, I don't have any legs because my dress drags on the ground and all of that sort of stuff. At some point, somebody has to step back and go, 
Because you don't really believe anything unless you, you believe it. And so long time ago I realized that almost everybody goes through a crisis of religion. Now, if you're trying to remember when you went through a crisis of religion, it might have been so, so fast that you can't remember it. It might have been a moment. You might have gone to church and sat down and go, what am I doing here? You might have asked yourself that question. And within minutes, you came up with an answer of why you were there and you stayed there. I'm not saying that people have to go through all this agony they put in movies, you know. But I, I feel very sorry for people that don't know why they, they believe or disbelieve. I think they should look at it. I have a friend who keeps telling me he's an atheist and he keeps buying books to prove that he's an atheist. I finally told him, you're not an atheist. I get so sick and tired of hearing you tell people you're an atheist. And then you go buy a book that disproves God. If you don't believe in God, fine. Don't believe in God. But stop telling everybody you don't believe in God. What are you trying to convince them of? And he goes, well, you know. I said, no, I don't know. You know, be happy with whatever it is you believe. And if you're not happy with it, look around and find something you do believe. Well, this notion developed that because the Buddhists pretty much believe in karma and rebirth, and they believe, but, but they believed when the Buddha died, he didn't come back. Because the, the Hindus had a notion, and they accepted that notion too, that if you became very, very pure, in other words, you're, you were not tainted, and they believe in a soul. In other words, Tom Mung, when he's reborn, it's Tom Mung again. There's a Buddhists have a slightly variation on that we won't go into right now. But when the Buddha died, he was done. And the strong belief was that if somebody who is completely pure or enlightened dies, they reunite with God. And that's the end of their journey. Well, okay, so what was the journey? Well, they were traveling towards God all this time. If you look at the, the Christians lost their sense of this. The notion of sin means to be separated from God. It doesn't mean to do something bad. It means to be separated from God. And if you reunite with God, you no longer live in sin. That's the whole foundation of the idea of being a Christian. That if you reunite with God, you can you have to, you live without sin. Doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. But there's things you don't intentionally do, like you don't steal and you don't rape and you don't hurt other people. That's a given. If you're really reunited with God, you're not going to do any of those things. Well, the Buddhists didn't quite have that. The Buddha went and reunited with Brahma, the creator God. But they thought, eh, we're not good enough. It's that old, we're not good enough thing again. And so they said, we're going to need extra help. We need a little boost. We need a buddy. And so they came up with the idea that if we were born under perfect conditions, we could become enlightened. Perfect conditions now. Well, what would be a perfect condition? Think about it. In, the, in your new life, let's say you're reborn, you marry a woman that never irritates you. You marry a man that never irritates you. That's pretty perfect that you take care, really good care of each other. That's pretty close to perfect. And so they had this notion of, and you would encourage each other. You would encourage each other to be good. You know, you would say things when your wife said to you, I'm 
really, really angry and I don't know why, you would try to find some way to help her calm down. You wouldn't do something dumb like say, well, stop being angry. Yeah, that always solves the problem, doesn't it? No, you would try to find some way to help her not be angry or help her not be lonely or to help her not feel helpless or him. You can plug in him or her anywhere you want here. Um, perfect conditions. And so the notion came up with the idea of perfect conditions. And these were all people that really wanted to do the very best they could. And so in their everyday life, they did the very best they could. But they knew that they weren't always perfect. And so they thought, you know, if I had the right rebirth, if I had the perfect rebirth, I would be born under uh, conditions where uh, my Buddhist practice would always be uh, good. I would always do good. I would have be surrounded by people that would encourage me to do good. Um, if I believed in meditation, I would have great meditation masters in the next life that would encourage me to do good meditation. If I kept, just simply kept the precepts, did a wonderful job of keeping the, keeping the precepts, and a few other ideas like, you know, compassion, taking care of others, uh, those things. I realize I'm, I'm going to be born under a condition where I'm going to have people that are encourage me to do that. And that would be the pure land. And so they had a Buddha. And the Buddha, and we got a lot of Buddhas. I can, I can turn you on to a sutra where you can spend four hours reading the names of different Buddhas. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but I can show you where to do it. And so the idea became that there's this Buddha, Amida. And Amida means infinite light. And just what it sounds like. Light that will drive away all, all darkness. And Amida lives in a pure land. And it's a pure land because nobody is bad to anybody else. Nobody is mean. Nobody ever gossips. Nobody kills anybody or anything. Nobody steals. Nobody commits adultery. Nobody does all of these things. It's a pure land. It's a land where only the practice of good precepts and, and good uh, ideas or practice it's like one set of ideas, we have lots of ideas in Buddhism, but some are more important than others. There's the six perceptions. One of the perceptions is per precepts. I'm sorry, I'm not speaking too well. Precepts is to develop wisdom. Another one is to develop a giving nature. In other words, donating. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean donating a church. Now, Han used to say, uh, that the job of a layperson was to support the monks, and you know that they need, in which they need support because traditionally monks don't work. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work out that way. But traditionally, monks sit around and cultivate. Yeah, and so we need somebody to give us some food once in a while, and uh, so that's dana. That's that's giving. It might be a little red envelope with ten dollars in it. Back in the days when cigarettes cost a dollar, remember those days? That's back when I used to smoke. I, I'm told that cigarettes cost like fourteen, fifteen dollars a pack now. I can't, I can't imagine how anybody in their right mind is going to pay. I used to smoke two packs a day. Spend thirty dollars a day on cigarettes? Oh, I'd be picking up butts off the ground and stripping them out so I could roll the old tobacco up at that kind of price. 
I mean, you could buy drugs at that kind of price, right? So, this pure land is a place when, when you pass away, if you pass away in a peaceful state, and, and people pray for you, and good wishes, and hope that you're reborn in the pure land, you will be born under conditions where you have encouragement to meditate, study the sutras, those are important, but also to follow the precepts, to become wise, to be giving, you know, go help at the senior citizen center. Go on a town, there's a food kitchen, they keep trying to close that place and somehow he keeps it going. You know, he's got to be a saint because they, the neighbors keep trying to change it, you know, close it. It's the only good thing in the neighborhood, but they keep trying to close it. You know, all of these things, you get to be born in that place where you have that. Well, that's the pure land. The Chinese believe that if you believe, if you believe strong enough, and you keep the precepts the very best you can, and you're the very best Buddhist you can be, that in your next life, you will be born in that pure land. And you will have incredible enlightened beings encouraging you and helping you towards full awareness of your true nature. At around the same time, over in Japan, uh, around the, it was the 13th century. Now, you gotta understand, in Japan, Buddhism came from Korea, you know, through China to Korea, because Korea sticks out there and almost touches Japan. The, the Koreans sent an emissary to the Japanese court. In the, always have to stop and think, if it's in the 300s, it's a 4th century. So it was a 4th century Japan. And they brought a statue of the Buddha. And they brought some uh, sutras, which is real interesting because the Japanese at that time didn't know how to read. So they taught them how to read. In other words, they gave them the Chinese characters that we're all familiar with, if you're not. Go, in, go into a biker bar and look at the tattoos and you'll see Chinese, right? And everybody always laughs. The Chinese always laugh at the bikers because they got a tattoo that says, I eat, I eat wonton soup. And they don't know it because they don't, they don't read Chinese, you know? Um, so the Koreans came over and they shared the language. It's been estimated at one time half the world could read each other's writings because they all use Chinese calligraphy, which are pictures. They, brought, they, they taught the China, Japanese how to count. At that time in the uh, fourth century, when Korea went there, this is how much the Japanese could count. They could count one through ten and then it was a bunch. Pretty primitive stuff. Can you believe that? One through ten. They didn't even use their toes. They only got to ten and then it was a bunch. And they brought a counting system to them because the Chinese had that. And they taught them to read and they shared their culture. Now if you tell that to a Japanese, they will want to attack you. But it still is historically true. It doesn't change because they don't like it. You know, because Japan is the center of all culture in the world, right? Also, China is the center of all culture in the world. Korea is the center of all. America is the center of all culture in the world. We're all the most important place we can possibly be. So time goes by, a long time goes by, and in the 13th century in Japan, right at the beginning of the 13th century, A monk comes along and decides that it's not natural to be celibate. And he was the Japanese Martin Luther. 
And he did exactly what Martin Luther did. He went and found him a pretty nun and married her. And said, the normal condition for human beings is to be married. Well, over in China, they never did that. But the Japanese, they marched their own drummer. And he began the Pure Land School in Japan, the Jodo Shin. And uh, it is the largest Buddhist school in Japan today. Because in order to be a minister in a Pure Land School, it's just like being a Protestant minister. You have to be good. You put on a little special robe every Sunday to give lectures. You go into a Pure Land temple in this country and it looks exactly like going into a, a Methodist church. They've got an organ, they've got pews, they sing Buddhist songs, you know, Jesus or Buddha loves me, this I know, for the sutras tell me so. That's actually in their book, I read it in there. And their belief is slightly different. They actually have a process that you're supposed to go through. Now the Chinese are doing it, some of them are doing it in the monasteries. Uh, they're reciting the Buddhist name over and over and over and over and over again. Now the ideal situation in China is similar to what's the ideal situation in Japan. is that you recite the Buddha's name while visualizing the Buddha. Okay, So in Japan, if you stop thinking about yourself and you just say uh, Namo Amitabha Buddha, 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 Namo Amitabha Buddha. And you've got this going on in your head. Anytime you have a free moment, in other words, there's not something you have to pay attention to. You recite that. You go outside, you have a cup of tea. And you recite the name of the Buddha. Homage to the Buddha. Namo kind of means homage. And you do that. And when you die, you'll be born in the pure land. And when you're born in the pure land, everything will work out good because you have somebody to support you. Because in this life, you don't have those perfect conditions. You don't have Buddhist teachers that you can follow. And you don't have people that surround you that encourage you. And the reality is it's all a great delusion. Because the pure land is right here. You're in the middle of it right now. It doesn't get any better and it doesn't get any worse. I'm here to encourage you. These guys in robes are here to encourage you. That's their job. That's why they make the big paycheck. Okay? To encourage you to be happy. To encourage you to be good. To encourage you to meditate. I don't care whether you meditate eight hours a day. If you can meditate 15 or 20 minutes every morning, this is good. If you can empty your mind of hate and anger, because the Buddha was very clear on these talking. Hate and anger are the most destructive things in the whole world to you, not to the person you hate. A lot of times the person you hate isn't even aware of you. That's why you hate them, right? They won't give you any recognition. Everything's already here. You're already in the pure land. You're already Buddha. You have everything you need. All you have to do is get out of your own way, and everything will work out just fine. And how much did I over-talk then? <laughs> Holy mackerel! <laughs>